Okay, in the book of Judges, we're chapter 9. We, the, today in Serbia, we came to chapter 17, interesting enough, because in verse 13 of chapter 17 is the uh, inspiration for the name of this, of this library, the hope of Israel, you know, and uh, it says all those who, who are against you, who rebel against you will be written on the earth, and so on, and uh, exhorts us that verse to keep and uh, hold on to the uh, fountain of the living waters, which is the eternal God, and not to be keeping and holding to the cisterns that are broken and that cannot hold the true water, which means that cannot really be the true teachings. But people just, you know, generally pe- people, just, brethren, people just love to basically turn to the broken cisterns in which there is no true living water. So that was very interesting because last night I was also inspired to address the Protestants once again. Uh, because now we have one of my close friends that I haven't seen haven't seen for ten years. The other day we were talking. She's basically now wants to be baptized, and she told me told me about the latest developments in the Protestant world, at least here in Serbia, and some of their stupid and silly doctrines like that they should be praying for the world to be the better place. Uh, where in the Bible do we have the instruction to pray for the world to be become better place? I don't know, but I asked them, asked the Serbian Protestants that very question, and uh, of course I'll probably not never get any answer because they have never really true answers to what the Bible speaks about. Now in chapter nine, so in, in English we have come to chapter nine, uh, and of the book of Jeremiah, and the first verse is, oh, oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. So you see, brethren, God is very sad and he hates to see his people in such a condition. We might notice these triplets all the way through in Hebrew. So again and again and again, God just uh, summarizes the total picture with a three words summary. Three word summary, you might say. So, uh, you know, uh, that's triplets that are very common in the Hebrew language. And some people notice that and would ask, why do we have tithe? only of corn, wine, and oil. You know, there are scriptures that mention those the three, and uh, they command tithing from those. Now, does it mean a fisherman has no tithe or of his catch, etc.? Well, what do we think Abraham tithed from his spoil? Certainly, gold and silver. But you see, these three are just a summary of the various aspects of agriculture. Corn is the field product, product you know, vine is the wine products, and oil is from trees. And anyone should get this unless you're so strained in your technicalities that you le- get lost in the woods and uh, you cannot see the forest lost among the trees. Now that happens to a lot of people. If you have a technical mind, don't let that happen to you. But you know, people just usually get lost in the woods. They cannot see, uh, they cannot see the forest because of a tree and because of their various silly ideas. And many of those silly ideas, as time goes on, seems to be very prevalent, especially among the Protestants who have all kinds of silly ideas and, 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 and uh, silly theories, among which is the one that we should be praying for a be- world to be the better place. Well, certainly not. Well, in this verse, we have three again. We have seen waters, tears, and a fountain. So there is a summary again, and we can mention that almost in every chapter of Jeremiah, we, you know, we have those triplets. Chapter 2, uh, verse 2, that he says, Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place for travelers, that I might leave my people and go from them, for they are all adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. Now, I wish I could hide from all this, Jeremiah says, and not be out here telling all these people about what is to happen and then see it happening. I wish I could leave all these people to themselves and go from them. Frankly, when I look at my neighborhood, uh, for, the most <laughs> for the most of the neighbors, I could exactly say the same. And perhaps that might be the case with some of you. But uh, we are realizing here in Serbia, uh, people are becoming worse and worse and worse morally. And it's very interesting that all the elderly people who should be, you know, crowned with wisdom and uh, life experience, they're even worse. Their curse words, their uh, lack of wisdom, uh, them having all around spying on all of us and kind of uh, being, I don't know, trying to be involved in our lives by spying on us, by gossip and stuff. It's absolutely amazing. They're in many cases much worse than even younger people. Verse 3, and like their bow, they have bent their tongues for lies. 
They are not valiant for the truth on the earth, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, says the Lord. And you know, when we listen to all those politicians, brethren, we see how this scripture is so meaningful even in our days. Everyone take heed to his neighbor and do not trust any brother, for every brother will utterly supplant and every neighbor will walk with slanderers. The world is quickly getting into that state, brethren. Have you noticed that? You cannot confide basically in anyone. Everyone will deceive his neighbor and will not speak the truth. They hate, they have taught their tongue to speak lies. They weary themselves to commit iniquity. Now, tongue, you know, it's another problem in the, in the last days. Uh, not governing the tongue, not ruling your speech, that's basically what's happening. You know, freedom, freedom to say anything, freedom to do whatever, you know, and to freedom to let your tongue, which is a small organ, as it says, <laughs> but it can make uh, terrible fires and it can just cause so much trouble. Tongue, not governing the tongue, not ruling the speech is a, a rapid problem that is developing in our world. You know, it says they have taught their tongue to speak lies. Well, you see, that sounds like advertising and commercials and all materialism, you know. Come and buy this, that, and the other. This is going to make a miracle in your life. Oh, my life have become a success ever since I tried this product or that product and so on and so forth. No, we cannot believe any of those advertising. You see, have you noticed Dr. Bob Thiel never ad advertises publicly through commercials, his, his services, his doctor of the natural medicine. He has, you know, superb products that are really... Uh, very useful. I've tested them when I was in Africa, when I contracted parasites in the very capital of Kenya. And uh, But we, he never uses these commercials. And it's better not to because many people don't even want to listen to the commercials thinking that it's all lies. But there's still many people nevertheless who are just falling for those lies and just, uh, you know, they just they just turn and, and, and become very materialistic. And we have all of these consumer-oriented societies around us and uh, the whole world is just uh, uh, permeated with, with that. It says they commit iniquity. That word is the sin of your nature. So it is what you are. Verse 6, it says your dwelling place is... No, it's your dwelling place in singular. Your dwelling place is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me, says the Lord. You see, brethren, they refuse to know God through deceit. Now notice that our pagan doctrines, immortal souls, ever-burning hells, going to heaven and trinity, through the deceit of paganism, brethren, Sunday, Christmas, Easter, and Halloween, through deceit they cannot come to know God. They think that is all Christian, you know, all, all the Christmases and Easter's and Halloween's, they think it's all Christian, and they don't care to really read the Bible and find the God of the Bible. And through all of that deceit, they refuse to know God as what is so bad about it. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will refine them and try them, for how shall I deal with the daughter of my people? In other words, God says, I cannot bless them. I cannot let them thrive and let the Oriental heathen and Arab Muslim go down first. No, I cannot. I cannot do that. I have to punish these false Christians first. How am I going to set up a Christian world for a thousand years if all these Oriental heathens and Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus think all that paganism is Christianity. How shall I deal with the daughter of my people? Well, I just got to melt them. That is what it is said. I just got to send them through the fire of tribulation and melt them away and melt them and melt away all that paganism from them and leave the pure Christianity that is there. Their tongue, verse 8, is an arrow shot out. It speaks deceit. One speaks peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but in his heart he lies in wait. And that is right, brethren. Christian peoples, God's nations, their tongue is an arrow shot out speaking deceit. They've got all these missionaries also teaching people wrong things in the name of Christianity and uh, teaching them and leading them into deceit. Verse 9, Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? I'll take up a weeping and wailing for the mountains and for the dwelling places of the wilderness, a lamentation because they are burned up so that no one can pass through, nor can men hear the voice of the cattle. 
Both the birds of the heavens and the beasts have fled. They are gone. You see, brethren, they are drought-stricken. They are scorched by sun. It shows us what God is going to do with a real productive land of the house of Israel because of the freakish weather. And, you know, nothing strange. We know that there will be freakish weather patterns and we are already feeling them even in this summer day and this summertime this year. We are feeling those freakish, you know, weather patterns. And you probably know, brethren, that it is prophesied in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 and 20, 29 that there's going to come, there's going, there's coming a horrible drought on the house of Israel in which the heaven will turn into a brass and the earth below will become just the dust. How wonderful, how horrible and terrible will be the drought that is going to, of course, affect the crops, that is going to affect the social relationships, that is going to affect the, if you wish, stability of, 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 of the Israelitish nations. And that drought is going to weaken them terribly. Weaken them terribly, and I need you, I was thinking these days about that, brethren, because of this wishy-washy Protestant, Protestant idea that we are here to pray for the world to become better place. I basically, you know, last night I, I, I cracked down on that silly idea, and I just quoted to them out of my heart, you know, of, 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 from my memory, I quoted to them the scriptures, which shows that this world is not going to become a better place, it's going to be worse and worse. The the very uh, uh, climax of how bad people are would be just before the return of Jesus Christ. You might remember in Revelation it says that Jesus Christ will show up on heaven, his face will be burning like a sun, he'll show up in heaven just prior to his descension, to his coming down from heaven. And what is the reaction of people? Do they repent? No, brethren. You can read in Revelation. They do not repent. They scream. They scream and they, uh, uh, they're, they're speaking terrible blasphemies against God. And they're saying to the, to the, to the stones, please fall on us that we may not see the face of Him who is coming down. You know, is that the better world of which Protestants dream? No, it's the, it's, it's, it's the pinnacle of human rebellion and hatred against God. You have all of the nations and all their armies will be gathered in Armageddon trying to prevent him from coming down. And what kind of better world is that, you know? And I said to those Protestants, the, 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 the Jesus Christ never said that we are to pray for the world to be better place. Jesus Christ said, watch and pray that you be accounted worthy to escape all these things that are happening. The Apostle Paul in Galatians calls this present even world. The Apostle Peter, when he was at the first Pentecost, the first New Testament Pentecost, in his first Holy Spirit inspired message, said people, please repent, be baptized. And he says with many words, he was convincing them saying, please become, be saved from this perverse generation. He, he called the first century generation perverse. What shall we say in the 21st century, brethren? So, uh, please do not fall for silly Protestant ideas. Always remember, I always exhort you to remember first, stop for a minute, whatever theory you hear, whatever idea you might hear from, especially coming from the, uh, 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 from the sources that are outside of the Church of God, the continuing Church of God, just please stop and think. What is written in the Bible? And once you remember what is written in the Bible, there is no way you'll be deceived by their silly, stupid theories. We are not to pray for the world to become a better place. Please don't pray for that. <coughs> if any of you does. We are to pray for a quick end. We are to pray to be accounted worthy to escape horrors that this world is going to execute against God's true people, against the Israelitish nations, and uh, against... Uh, I mean, both houses of Israel, the Jews and the Israelites, and against God's people, those lukewarm Christians who will remain behind. And one of the reasons why they're so lukewarm, why they just do not understand what is the great, why they do not do not understand what is laid in store for us and for the true church, is the fact that they cannot imagine how horrible the great tribulation be, can be and will be. And because they cannot really fathom how horrible it would be, they think 
that Jesus Christ doesn't really speak, he doesn't really mean that when he says great tribulation and horrors. No, he doesn't really mean that. It cannot be that bad. Well, it will be that bad. And as I said today to the Serbian congregation, perhaps I have never given you a plastic description of the Great Tribulation, brethren, but I will do it today on this anniversary of our third library. Yes, because our library contains all these materials and books on the House of Israel, on its origin, migrations, um, heraldry. And I'll give you in, in, about, in about an hour, we're going to have this short anniversary ceremony. I'm going to give you a short speech to remind you once again. To remind you that, you know, uh, we have the materials here that teach us how we are blessed when we obey God and how we are cursed and punished when we don't. The Great Tribulation, we have all here various information on the Great Tribulation, thankfully. We have all the writings of Dr. Bob Thiel. We have got some of my, my things in Serbian and in English. The Great Tribulation, brethren, plastically explained, is the German and European Nazi concentration camp. German and European and Nazi uh, 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 death camps, labor camps, forced labor camps, the all the horrible crimes that were committed against the Jewish people, and uh, all those crimes will be committed again uh, uh, against the House of Israel. It is going to be the Holocaust of the Ephraim, and Ephraim is the leading tribe in Israel, the leading tribe of all the ten tribes. Yes, and ninety percent of the Anglo-Saxons are going to perish in those in those concentration camps, labor camps, and so on. Only 10% will survive. Horrible time, indeed. Perhaps even 10% of the Jewish people would survive. We don't know what will be with the nations of the south of the northern Europe. I would presume that they may not perhaps be sent to the concentration camps, but their countries will become like concentration camps. In what way? Because all their economy, all of their sovereignty will be completely reduced and directed to the to work for the benefits of the German war industry, but and that's the great tribulation in, in in the most vicious and most plastic terms described. And the hunger will be so bad caused by this drought. Hunger will be so bad that you know in the in your nations, brethren, it's prophesied in Leviticus twenty six, and even more graphically described in Deuteronomy twenty nine. In your nations, there will be cannibalism. Uh, mothers and fathers will be eating their children. I think I mentioned this at various occasions to you, but I need to remind you, brethren, I need to remind you because one of the problems of the Laodiceans is they cannot imagine, they cannot fathom, they cannot believe, they don't believe Jesus Christ when he says that is going to happen. And it's all written in the Bible. In the Old Testament, Jeremiah 30 and verse 7, it's called the uh, the the, uh, the trouble... Uh, the trouble of, 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 of Jacob, Jacob's trouble. In the Gospels in the New Testament, Jesus Christ calls it all the Great Tribulation. So one way or the other, that's what it is. Your nations in which you live are primarily going to be punished as false Christians. They're primarily going to be punished with this drought. They're primarily going to be punished with hunger and uh, cannibalism, and then comes what your nations never experienced in their lives, in their history. It will be the occupation by a foreign power. That's what the Great Tribulation is, brethren. I need to keep reminding you of that, lest you fall into a Laodicean attitude. That's the least that I want for you and others. And uh, I'm glad that we are here at Philadelphia Remnant. I've also, I've also made another message for those former Worldwide Church of God members to encourage them to stay wherever they are. And I praise them for not joining these other churches of God. And you know why, brethren? Because the other churches of God, as you may remember from the spe from one of the messages from Dr. Bob Thiel, the other churches are registered under 501c3. Their legal status is that they are actually charities which receive donations from the state. And because of that, they are not free to preach the full truth because they have to always adjust their teachings to the state and what the state proposes and what the state requires, lest they lose donations. Now you tell me, Brendan, isn't that hypocritical? Isn't that horrible? Isn't that Laodicean? Yes, it is. The only church that is not registered as, as such is the Continuing Church of God. You might probably remember we are registered as... Now let me read from this latest publication we received, the Catholic Church, Beliefs of the Original Catholic Church. We are, we are uh, registered as Continuing Church of God and Successor, a corporation's soul. 
And that's what it is. We have full freedom. We are not required to obey the state, give reports to the state, report to them how many members we have, what activities have we done to, re to, to deserve their donation, like youth camps, summer education camps, and all of that rubbish. Brethren, that's what they, churches, the churches of God, that's what they do. That's how they, how that's, we, we just realized that because of the previous association that some of us here in Serbia were part of. That's so shameful, that's horrible. And I'm so glad now that I know that. I'm so glad that the various people who remain yet unaffiliated, I'm so glad that they are unaffiliated. Because if they're affiliated with those churches of God, they will be dragged straight into the Laodicean attitude, brethren. Because what kind of attitude is that? Oh, yes, let's receive donation from the countries, from the state, and we'll just, you know, we'll just receive, keep money, receiving money from them. What kind of Christianity is that? So I encourage those people who are not affiliated, please don't affiliate with those Laodicean churches. Better stay by yourself and watch over your spiritual state. Try not to fall into the Laodicean attitude. But you can still participate in the work, regardless of your affiliation. You can still contribute to the work of God. That's your, uh, that's your obligation. You're still God's people. You still have the same obligation to tithe and stay faithful to the God. So you can still help the work of God, but do not affiliate with those Laodicean churches. And keep in mind that we are not registered with that legal status. We don't depend on the, on the state and the government and what the government dictates. And we are free to speak. And because of that, we are censored once, for once in a while. One of the reasons why I've been a little bit late with this, with this holy convocation, brethren, was because Bob, 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 Bob Thiel phoned me. Uh, over Skype to ask me about my visa status with Australia, but also to inform me that today he is going to give a sermon that is most likely going to be censored from YouTube because he's going to speak on the consequences of COVID-19 vaccines. And that the death rate is 40 times, I think he said to me, 40 times higher in America than in Ghana or in, in Haiti. And he is going to tell, tell the truth, which of course these platforms do not like but i'm glad he he just wanted to give me an in advance notice don't worry we're probably i'm probably going to be censored i said fine we've got some alternative ways and alternate platforms that we're going to use for the benefits of god's people we're going to speak the truth brethren we don't care what the government is going to require us to say but the other churches of god are not in that position you see brethren now I'm telling you, unless you understood, let me tell you why. Because they registered about 5501C3, I think. Uh, and that legal status is that, oh, they're charities. And they give reports to the government how many members they have, what their activities were. And because of that, they receive subsidies from the government. You need to know that, brethren. You need to know what's the difference between us as a Philadelphia remnant and them as a bunch of Laodiceans. Because they're in one foot, they're in the, in the state receiving money from the government. Could you believe it? How can you receive the money from the government? Because I preach at the same time the, the true gospel, which is about the kingdom of God, which is about the government of God going to be restored in this world and going to annul all of those governments. And, you know, send them into the history forever. How can you do that? But they do it, brethren. Perhaps not, not all of those Church of God groups, perhaps not all of those, but the vast majority of them, and most certainly the largest groups of God that you know of. And I felt that, I felt that they, 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 the uh, people who have never affiliated with any of those churches should know that. I feel, feel brethren, that you should know that. And you know what? I also mentioned to those to, uh, uh, perhaps if there were some members of those big groups that would be listening to me, I mentioned to them, you're being lied to, you have no idea the, of, of the legal status of your churches of God, and you're not obligated to stay there because they're lying to you, they're hypocrites, and they're Laodiceans. They're dragging you straight into the Laodicean attitude. You leave them as soon as possible. Because it's even better to be unaffiliated than to be affiliated with them. Anyway, the drought is brethren coming. They will not tell you all those churches of God. They don't speak, that's why they don't speak prophecy, because it's all against the government regulations. They don't speak because it's too, it's too negative. Well, it's the truth written in the Bible. The drought is coming, horrible drought, which will cause cannibalism, which is going to cause all kind of upheaval and havoc in your Western world. 
It's coming because of the disobedience. God says, if you obey me, I'll bless you. But if you don't disobey me, I'm going to do this, that, and the other. Among those, this, that, and the other is the drought, horrible drought, and cannibalism. I cannot even imagine how horrible it's going to be. But we all have to endure through that, brethren, which will be horrendous. But we have to endure through all of that. That's why we need to stay faithful. That's why we need to keep being humble. That's why we need to pray to God. And to those among us who may think that owning a gun is going to save them, well, your gun is going to be worth nothing. Because the drought, you cannot you know, fight against the drought with gun. You cannot fight against the uh, hunger with gun. And your gun is not going to help you at all. It's only the grace of God that can save all of us from any and every trouble. Not guns and pistols and whatever. So, we have read in, in, in verse 10, Jews of that time were drought-stricken, scorched by sun. And it shows, it shows us what God is going to do with a real productive land. Because America has a real productive land. Britain as well. But Britain has already destroyed by GMO and planting GMO with disgusting seeds. And weather, weather is getting worse and worse. So in your countries it's going to become very soon a terrible drought. Verse 11, I'll make Jerusalem a heap of ruins, a den of jackals. I'll make the cities of Judah desolate without an inhabitant. Well, as if we are reading Ezekiel chapter 5 and 6. Remember Ezekiel 6, 6. Your cities will lay waste. And speaking, Ezekiel was speaking to the house of Israel. Here we see that the house of Judah and their cities would be desolate without an inhabitant. Why, brethren? Why? Well, because of people's sins and because people do not want to, they don't want to repent. And sadly, within the God, Church of God, continuing Church of God, my, my greatest conflict with people was, was and has always been when people do not want to repent. When they just want to go their own way, when they think that they're owning gun or whatever is the way to defend themselves, and they always think that I'm trying to kind of subvert them in their... Yes, I'm subverting them in their wrong ways because I always tell them what the Bible speaks. And I'm obligated to God to say that. And I felt obligated last night to speak to the members of these other churches of God to tell them you're being lied to. You are being lied to. You have no idea what is the legal status of your of your churches. They do not preach to you any prophecy because, and by doing so, they're not preaching one third of the Bible. Like one of our members here in Serbia said to me last night, you see, remember when we were in that, that church with that legal status? I said, yes, I do. And do you remember we come for the Sabbath expecting spiritual food and what do we get? Nothing. And he's right. They get nothing because how can you not preach one third of the Bible expect to get something useful, palatable, acceptable, Godly. Brethren, as time goes on, more and more I'm realizing what, uh, what the Laodiceanism is, is, is encompassing. I was thinking it was all personal spiritual state of individuals. I'm coming to see it's not in that. Because the only message when it comes to Laodicea, it says to the churches of God in plural. That's the only era, church era, in which you have plural. And I'm coming to see it's not only the personal uh, kind of uh, uh, personal kind of state of, of of spiritual affairs, brethren. It is the collective spirit, spiritual state of those churches, and all of them are registered so to be charities, except for one of them, the Continuing Church of God. And yes, we know that the latest now message by Bob Till most likely will be censored. Because, of course, it doesn't, it doesn't correspond with what the government wants us to believe. But we are going to speak the truth, brethren, without fear. That's how the Philadelphians are to live. Without fear. We have to live the truth regardless of the consequences. And live by faith and not by sight. And, you know, rely on God to protect us. That's all part of, the, of this book of Jeremiah. Also chapter 6, 17 that we covered today in Serbian language. In which God says, as I told you, the, the, the verse that inspired me to name this library, the hope of Israel. O oh, hope of Israel, mikve Yisrael. All those who turn against you, they are turning from the fountain of living waters. Their names will be written on the earth. Remember who was writing on the earth when they caught Mary Magdalene supposedly in adultery? With no, with no man, it was only Mary Magdalene. Now they're testing Jesus. You know, while this, this, man, this woman now deserves death. 
by stoning. So what do you say? And he, what did he do? He began writing something on the earth. Perhaps their names. Or perhaps their sins that nobody knew about. <laughs> and just one by one, they just turn away and go go away. Oh, one by one, and all of a sudden, nobody's there. Verse 12. Who is the wise man who may understand this? Brethren, are we wise to understand this book? Are we humble enough to understand this book, brethren? Uh, uh, humility is one of the problems also of Laodicean churches. They are just so proud. Oh, we have gained so much knowledge. We don't. We have no need of anything. Oh, really? But I've seen people even in our midst who believe and who are totally deceived that they've got it all because they own guns and because they've got all kinds of silly ideas about the uh, aliens, uh, pyramids, and I don't know what other kinds of creatures and so on. And they think they're just so enlightened. The uh, latest enlightenment enlightenment among the Protestants, I'm informed by this friend of mine that I met on Thursday. I haven't seen her for ten years, and she she has been having uh, she has been you know having really rough time, but she has been growing and still faithful reading the Bible. And somehow came across my channel, began listening to the messages in Serbian. There are many messages I have in Serbian and English. And then she said, "I didn't even realize how much I didn't know. I didn't realize how what all things I was supposed to ask. I had no idea. Well, please come, let us meet in person, and let's now discuss things, real things of essence." And the first very thing that we discussed would be the the, the baptism, of course, the need for baptism as a first step in in our salvation, but the baptism requires fruits of the repentance, and so on. She says, well, fine, with tithing, I have no problem. With the holidays, they're so deep and have so such a deep meaning. She said, well, as each holiday will come up, you just let me know what they really mean, what their deep meaning is, and so on. And she says, when you when you realize that I'm ready for baptism, you would tell me. I said to her, well, look, you're an adult. You've got, you know, you've got, uh, you've got very big experience. You're married. You've got a child. Uh, and so I said to her, you know, you're basically ready, but we need to make formal uh, counseling so that I can explain to you perhaps things that you may not know, things perhaps that you may have misunderstood, and so on and so forth. And we spoke five hours, brethren, in raw. Five hours we had a discussion because she came to a mountain resort not far away from me, so I was able to get there. And uh, five hours since we met, we've had five hours of discussion on spiritual matters, on what the Bible teaches. She would ask me about certain verses, what they might mean, and so on and so forth. And from her, I realized, because she's in touch with various Protestants, she, I realized what is the latest trend in Protestants. Flat earth, would you believe that? And I said to her, well, you see, they're ignoring the truth being preached to them in Serbian or in English, regardless. And when people are just exposed too long to wrong doctrines, they become they become idiots. They get all kinds of silly ideas. And it's going to be worse and worse. And among those silly ideas is that we should be praying for the world to become a better place. To be. No, it's not going to happen. You see what happens to Jerusalem? It'll be desolate without inhabitant. Remember Ezekiel 6.6, 6, the house of Israel, the cities. Your cities will be laid waste. And who is the man, verse 12, who understand, may understand this? Brethren, I want you to understand it all. And who is he to whom the mouth of the Lord has spoken that he may declare it? Why does the land perish and burn up like a wilderness so that no one can pass through? You see, such wise people understand why God has to punish the Christian nations first, brethren. And he may declare it. Verse 13. And the Lord said, Because they have forsaken my... That's why. They have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, nor walked according to it. But they have walked according to the dictates of their own hearts and after the Baals, which their fathers taught them. Now, would you think, if someone just opened their Bible and went through Ezekiel and Jeremiah like we have done, that they would recognize what is wrong with Christianity, brethren. You think they would? Well, over and over and over it says, they have forsaken my law. They've gone away from my statutes and judgments. They substituted with their own ways. Now, would anyone see that, brethren? Would anyone recognize that? And you see, all those customs that are so-called Christian come back to sun worship, that is, to Baal worship and to paganism. But hopefully we, being led by the whole God's Holy Spirit, can understand that. Here in the library, the host of the hope of Israel, and I've just 
I'm, I'm purposely sitting right here where we'll have this uh, anniversary service in, 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 in about 45 minutes. Purposely on that library, I'm looking now at my book collection. I'm looking right at the books speaking about pagan heritage of the world. And then I have a section, Pagan Heritage of Serbian Nation, because the Serbian paganism is very specific. <laughs> it has very specific beliefs and, and, and crazy things that are just unimaginable. So, you know, we have the world with, uh, with, with general worldwide customs that are pagan, but, you know, Serbian customs, Serbian customs are unique, unique to the Serbian nation, and they, they have a special flavor of paganism. We need to understand that, brethren. We in Serbia need to understand it, of course, because we are going to be in the world tomorrow. We are supposed to be teaching and re-educating Serbian people. The rest of you in the world, yeah, you need to understand the uh, the problem that you have. Uh, I remember when I was I was counseling, perhaps about a couple of weeks ago, with a man from England, a little, very lovely person and and, and and very enjoyable to speak with, uh, having no uh, some kind of arrogance that is so seems to be inherent in English people, at least to me, at least from my perspective. But anyway, very humble, very informed, very well informed. And he said to me, but you know, uh, we Anglo, we we here, we British, we're not that kind of evil, you know. Well, I said to him, look, many of you are not that kind of evil. Uh, and there is no, e there are no evils that I can find in you that I can find in a Gentile nation like mine. You're not that really bad and that evil like a Gentile nation called Serbians or any other Gentile nations you might mean, name. But I said, you know, what is your problem, Harry, of your nation? The problem of your nation is that your nation has a knowledge, clear knowledge about God's ways, but your nation purposely rejects it. Not only your nation, but the nations, you know, nations of all the uh, Ephraim, Australia, England, America, Canada, New Zealand. I said, look at just all those commentaries you have in English. Do you realize, I said to him, that other nations have nothing of that sort? You people in America and Britain have some outstanding individuals. They have dedicated their lives to searching the Bible, searching the uh, Bible, uh, excavating various sites, uh, pointing out, commentating, searching the history, biblical history. Amazing people. What is, I think Budge, Budge comes to my mind when it comes to England. He decried the whole Egyptian religion. And we've got his commentaries in this E-Sword program. Short, right to the point commentaries. Amazing commentaries. Look at the Adam, look at J Jameson Fawcett and Brown in, 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 you know, from America. Look at Adam Clark. In his, in his article on the birth of Christ, he clearly says that December 25th cannot be his birth. Brethren, it, Protestant commentator says that. And that's what you people in the West do know. You people in the West, you know what is a true day of rest. You know what is the seventh day. Many Gentile nations have no clue. You have to teach them from the scratch. You people in the West, you know at least who is Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, you know. With many people in, the, in, in here who are superstitious, Catholic, Orthodox, etc., you have to start explaining the background so that they would get the idea who those people were, faithful people of God who were, of course, rewarded for their faithfulness. In your nations, you do know that Christmas, all Americans, I think, or most Americans, or at least the educated Americans, do know that Christmas is pagan holiday. Because during that season, when I published something on Facebook, they were saying, wait, but we know it's pagan. But we don't celebrate paganism, we celebrate Christ. Of course, to which my response is, you cannot celebrate Christ because Christ gave in the Old Testament specific dates that you are to celebrate his holidays. And plus, you just Christianized that day. That day has nothing to do with Christ's birth, as Adam Clark confirms, based on the Bible. You can call it Christian all that you want, but it's not. It's lie because Christ was not, first of all, born in that day. And secondly, God is eternal, so God knows the origin of that holiday the origin of that paganism, and he knows how many children and perhaps adults were sacrificed during those days. So he knows it has nothing to do with him and his son. The same with Easter, which was, as you know, uh, imposed on the Christian world by Constantine the Great Pagan. So you can call those things, you know, Christian, but they're not Christian at all. 
But the problem with you, the, the main problem with you, I said to this lovely man, to you people in Britain and America, is that you know those things. You know what is paganism. You know it's not acceptable to God. You know it is not in the Bible. But you refuse to give up on that. You refuse to accept the true way of God because you love your paganism. And that's the problem throughout the whole history of Israel, brethren. They always wanted to be pagans. From the moment they left Egypt, oh, we need to go back to Egypt. Oh, here is the, here is the, um, uh, what is the word? Here is that animal anyway. Here is the animal that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Calf. Here is the calf, oh, Israel that brought you. Let's go back to Egypt. And then they come to the promised land. Their next generation, because all these other, the older ones just died out in the wilderness. The next generation comes into the promised land, land flowing with milk and honey, water, waterfall, blessings. But they say, we don't want to be God's people. No, we want to be like these nations around us. We want to be pagans. And today is the same problem with British and Americans, brethren. You know what? The heraldry of Britain and America and Australia and New Zealand testifies who they are. Look at the flag of North, North, North Ireland. How would you explain the flag of Northern Ireland of Ulster if you did not Bible history, if you did not know Bible history? It's so clear. It's right there before our eyes. All the heraldry, if nothing else, does testify who British and Americans are. But what is the reaction of British and Americans? Oh no. No, we don't care. We want to be pagans. We don't want to be, we don't want to be keeping God's commandments. We want to be pagans just like all the other pagans. Well, wonderful. That's why God is going to send you real pagans, Germans and Europeans, real pagans, who are going to show you how cruel or disgusting, cruel and ruthless and lawless is paganism. So you'll be serving them in the death concentration camp in uh, in, 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 in other concentration, in, 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 in forced labor camps, in all kinds of horrible ways, you're going to serve them and their gods and their paganism because you wanted to be pagans. You didn't want to rely on God's help and be God's people. You don't want to be God's people. Fine. God says, fine. I'm just, I'm just going to send you real pagans now because you're not really pagans in the past. You're supposed to be my people, but you want to be pagans? Fine. Here comes the European pagans all together to show you what paganism is all about, how ruthless, terrible, and lawless it is. And then when 90% of you get, you know, get killed in that great tribulation, then 10% of you who remain, that remnant is going to come to its senses and abhor itself and say, what have we done to ourselves? That's, brethren, why the great tribulation, you might say, yeah, you might say British and Americans are not that, that bad people. Yes, I agree with you. The Gentiles are far worse, brethren. But the problem is the knowledge. Little knowledge causes <laughs> causes some trouble, right? Much knowledge causes more trouble. Of all the people in the world, in English language, you, you had outstanding individuals. Even though they were Protestants, nevertheless, you had outstanding individuals who were who have who have been dedicated, who had been dedicating to dedicated to. Uh, Clearing up the Bible and its teachings for us. And today we've got their commentaries. I mentioned Jameson, Fawcett and Brown, Adam Clark, Budge. There are others perhaps, but these three just come to my mind because I often consult them when I have to, you know, understand something in the Bible. And what a wonderful blessing. But you have it in English language, brethren. Such literature does not exist in Korean, in Japanese, in Chinese, in Serbian, in Croatian, in Hindu, you name it. The knowledge is your problem, you see. Because you know. The Anglo-Saxon people know the true day of red, the true way of God. But they don't want it. They reject it. No, we want to be pagans. Fine, God says, I'll send you the pagans. Yes, I know nobody is going to tell you this. All these wishy-washy Protestant churches which just preach about love, you know, and that you need to give your heart to Jesus and Jesus on the Golgotha and that you need to come before Jesus on Golgotha and, and kneel down and give your heart to Jesus and all of that rubbish, brethren. And of course, Protestants live in this, 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 this brainwashed state of mind. They've got plenty of money, you know, they don't know what is hunger, they've got no idea what is economic problem, but it's not going, they don't know what are the sanctions. Unlike the rest of the world, they have no clue about this, that, and the other. So obviously, until the Great Tribulation comes to, to strike them, they will not understand what an evil and terrible world is in which we live. And they'll be keeping, they'll keep praying for the world to become a better place. Yeah, sure.
Verse 15, Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I'll feed them, these people, with warm wood, and give them water of God to drink. I'll scatter them also among who? The Gentiles. You want to be pagans? Wonderful Jewish people, you'll be scattered among the Gentiles. You Israelites, you want to be pagans? Wonderful, yeah, just say so. I'll scatter you among the real pagans. To see their terrible lives, to see their awful customs, to see their superstition. And then you'll remember those of you who remain, you'll remember who you are. And you'll remember your heraldry that you reject. And you'll remember the Sabbath day that you rejected for Sunday. you remember the holidays of God that you call Jewish holidays. But you'll at least have to recognize those are the true holidays of God. And you will repent, but only 10% of you. Oh my, oh my word, what a horrible thing. The people say, but why is God God? No, it's not God. It's people. God's truth is very simple. It's right there in the Bible for people to learn. They don't want it? Fine. God is not going to now meddle into their affairs. Just like he did in the affairs of Adam and Eve. The first very uh, service that was there was on the seventh day when God rested. He didn't need any rest, but he rested. He gave the humans rest and he held service with them. He taught them their ways from the very, very beginning. But humans chose the wrong tree. They said, well, we don't want you, God. We want to determine what is for us good and bad. And it's bad enough you're in Israelitish countries, but brethren, I can tell you, it's even much worse, far worse in the Gentiles, among which Israelites are going to be scattered, including the Jewish people, the house of Judah. Scatter them among the Gentiles whom neither they nor their fathers have known. Yes, indeed. Your fathers did not know about the new state that is emerging fast before our eyes. It's European Union or the uh, or the United States of Europe. That's a new nation, brethren. Your fathers didn't know about those that nation. My fathers didn't know about that nation. So there he is going to scatter the Jewish people in the house of Israel in those horrible concentration camps and death camps and, and labor forced labor camps. And you'll be drinking warm wood, you know, gall to drink. And I'll send a sword after them until I have consumed them. Isn't that horrible? It is what people ask for. I mean, uh, we here in, in this gentle world, there are just some of us who are f- true Christians, we believe. We just look what British Amer- people do, what Americans do, and we just wonder, are they really provoking God directly? They're so haughty that they, with their deeds, with their words, with their actions, they're so haughty that they basically, as if they're provoking God on purpose to come down and destroy them for all their horrible things that they're doing against God. In Ezekiel chapter 5, it says exactly the same thing in verse 1 and 2 that we have just read in verse 16. It says, And you, son of man, take a sharp sword, take it as a barber's razor. Remember who was the barber's razor? Germany and the king of Assyrians from Isaiah chapter 10. And pass it over your head and your beard. Then take scales to weigh and divide the hair. You shall burn with fire one third in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are finished. The days of the siege, meaning the international sanctions, which will be slammed against you by Germany and European super state brethren. Then you shall take one third and strike it around with the sword. And one third you shall scatter into the wind. Exactly what we just read in, 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 um, Jeremiah chapter 16 of, uh, uh, of, uh, 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 chapter 9 verse 16 that is. And then in Ezekiel chapter 5, we, we, we already went through the book of Ezekiel, so you might remember, in verses 3 and 6, 3 and 4, that is, says, You shall also take a small number of them and bring, bind them in the edge of your garment. That will be a Philadelphia remnant. Then take some of them again and throw them into the midst of the fire and burn them in the fire. From there a fire will go out into all the house of Israel. Brethren, that never happened. Every time there was a fire, meaning war, this uh, occupation, only it would be only one part of the house of Israel, northern part of the uh, of the of the northern part of the northern kingdom of Israel, or you know the house of Judah was attacked, one part, but never there was a fire that went out into the all the house of Israel. That can only be the great tribulation. That can only be what is prophesied. What Jesus Christ said would be the most horrible time in history. But Laodiceans do not believe that. Laodiceans cannot. Fathom them, so Laodiceans actually do not trust Jesus Christ. Which makes them Laodicean as well. Among other things and factors. And a few of them, you see, few of them are taken to the place of safety, protected from the tribulation. So the same thing in Jeremiah is repeated in Ezekiel. So when Israel is scattered among the nations, God send, 
he sends sword even after that final third that are scattered among the nations, among the Gentiles. And a lot of them are consumed until only one tenth is left, brethren. And again, even though morally not many Anglo-Saxon people, when it, when it comes to morality, I always pointed out in my nation, many Anglo-Saxon people are far more moral than nations of Gentiles, including Serbs. Many people in the Anglo-Saxon world are very honest. Many people are not fornicating. They have very nice marriages with very nice families. Many of them cannot even imagine to lie the way that the Gentiles can lie to you, brethren. Many of you are, from the point of view of the Gentiles, very naive but that's beautiful. And it's not, I've, I've come to realize, it's not even moral perversion that may be one of the main factors for the Great Tribulation. Brethren, it's not that, it's the knowledge that you have. Israelites were the only nation to whom God trumpeted into their ears His commandments. No other nation has ever, has ever had that experience. Israel, the house of Israel, is the only nation that turned away from living God to dead idols. No other nation in the world has ever done that. But you have done it with the knowledge. The house of Israel done it, has done it with the knowledge. And deep down in all of your Anglo-Saxon and Israelitish hearts, you do have knowledge that God is true, that God is real. You do know from the Bible what is the true Sabbath and what are the true holidays. You know that your societies are steeped into paganism and you refuse to change. The knowledge of God's way, which is... A great privilege that Israelites have, unlike other Gentiles, is one of the main factors that is going to drive the Israelitish nations to the Great Tribulation. Bread. And I'm coming to realize that. Yes, I recognize, and I'm, I'm not ashamed to tell you, morality of the Israelitish nations is much better in many ways. At least, okay, let's, let's, uh, let, let's put it that way. Morality of many people, not all, but many people in Israel the nations is much higher, much better, much more pure than the morality of the Gentiles, which is permeated with superstition, with sexual looseness, with cursings, even cursing God, with all kinds of horrible things, with, with, with witches, mediums, etc., 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 brethren. All that you need to do is go to Africa, see that horrible abject poverty, and then you realize, oh, they've got plenty of black magic there. The same with Haiti. Surprise, surprise, right? You don't have all of that so much present in your nations. But brethren, you've got something that other nations don't have. I'm realizing that. You've got the knowledge of the true way of God. But you purposely, I mean, not you, but I mean your nations, your kinsmen, purposely, on purpose, uh, 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 willingly, reject that knowledge. They don't want to be God's people and be different from the world. They want to be pagans and be the same like the world. That's one of the main problems that is going to lead the Israel Atlantic nations into the Great Tribulation, the knowledge. Because that condemns you. Because you know, unlike Gentiles who have never known the truth, you know for generations, or you feel, or you instinctively do understand what is the true way of God, and you do know what is when, when you hear this message that this is really the truth, but no, you just reject it. You don't want to be part of God's work. You don't want to be part of God's people. Thus says the Lord of Hosts, verse 17, Consider and call for the mourning women, that they may come, and send forth skillful wailing women, that they may come. So they hired women to give, grieve and to wail. There will be so many dead that they will have to teach their daughters to be professional mourners, brethren. Let them make haste and take up a wailing for us that our eyes may run with tears and our eyelids gush with water for a voice of wailing heard from Zion. How we are plundered. We are greatly ashamed. Because we have forsaken the land. Because we have been cast out of our dwellings. In other words, we have corrupted the land so badly that it is progressively becoming desolate. Their own environment will cast them out. We're speaking here about the house of Judah. But brethren, nothing is different from the house of Israel. I just mentioned to you the weather patterns and the coming drought, which is going to completely change the scale the the, the 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 landscape of your society drought lack of food stores supermarkets will be broken into loot people will looting because of hunger there'll be cannibalism and those of you who think that your guns are going to save you you're just terribly terribly wrong 
because when a hungry mass comes against you, one of the one of the authors, one of my famous famous fa- favorite authors, Emile Zola from France, he was he was a realist. He he belongs to to the to the, to the writers who are, who are uh, who are classified as realism. He described a hungry mass of people when they start. Nothing can stop them, brethren. Because hunger, and many of you have never felt hunger. I had a point in my life when I was without any food in my in my home, and it was by God's grace. One of these days, I'll tell you about that story. It was by God's grace that I was rescued. I was ill, in bed, bedridden. I was rescued miraculously because of a circumstance that happened. I know what hunger is, brethren. Is the most horrendous feeling you can have. And with awareness, there is no food that can quench that hunger or satisfy it. That's even worse. That's a psychological state of mind in which people are no longer rational. To the point that they can even eat their own children as prophesied in the Bible for the nations in which you, brethren, live. Not even for the Gentile nations, but for the nations in which you live. Verse 20. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O women, and let your ear receive the word of his mouth. Teach your daughters wailing and everyone her neighbor a lamentation. There is so much death, brethren. There will be so much death. For death, verse 21, has come through our windows, has entered our palaces to kill off the children, no longer to be outside, and the young men no longer on the streets. Now the word children means infants. So it is that horrible. Verse 22. Speak, thus says the Lord. Even the carcasses of men shall fall as refuse on the open field, like cuttings after the harvester, and no one shall gather them. So they're just left there in the coming Holocaust. Thus says the Lord. Let not be the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. There is, you see, a triplet here again. And I'm surprised the Trinitarians did not pick up that and use it as an argument for Trinity. They use holy, holy, holy is God as a proof of Trinity, you see. When the angel comes and proclaims, whoa, 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 that is to them also a proof of Trinity. But they missed the one that would be the most logical one. But look at what are the problems of men. Wisdom, glory, riches. That is pretty good summary. They are just left there in that holocaust. But let him, verse 24, who glories, glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth, Triplet again, loving kindness, right judgment in the air. For in these I delight, says the Lord. So, brethren, we don't need to glory in wisdom because that led many people out of the church. Because, you know, over the time they become self righteous and obsessed with their own wisdom. See, the Laodiceans are obsessed with, well, we are so wise, we have got so rich, we have need of nothing. You see, they're so rich with knowledge, at the same time, Christ has to be knocking on their door. And says, if anyone hears me, they're so deceived that they just need, if anyone hears him. In the meantime, you know, they're having donations from the countries, from the government. And yet they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, the true gospel of Christ. But God, Christ says, if anyone hears me, you know, let him open the door. Anyone hears They're so obsessed with their wisdom, their knowledge, their whatever. Their buildings, their church buildings, their congregations, their preaching to the wealthy nations like Canada and America, and not preaching to the poor countries because, you know, that would just take away that money. They're so obsessed with their wisdom that they just don't hear Jesus Christ knocking on the door. So, don't be, don't need to glory in your wisdom, brethren, that led many people out of the church. We don't need to glory in mind. Ambitious people tend to get lost in that. And some have gloried in riches. However, there is another threefold summary in this verse. Now, this triplet presents us with the character of God's character here. Loving kindness, as I mentioned, judgment, 
and righteousness. Is that all that God exercises? No more than we only tithe on corn, wine, and oil. Verse 25, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. Thou punish all which are circumcised with the uncircumcised. So, brethren, everyone that claimed to be a Christian is going to get punished in the last trumpet plagues, in the last days of punishment, all in unison, whether they're circumcised or uncircumcised. Verse 26, Egypt, Judah, Edom, the people of Ammon, Moab, and all who are in the farthest corners who dwell in the wilderness. For all these nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in the heart. Well, yes, indeed, our heart becomes circumcised, brethren, when we are baptized. Jesus Christ circumcises spiritually our heart. But to be baptized, a nation or part of nation or certain individuals from a nation need to repent first. We see no repentance, not even on the horizon in the Israelitish nations, nor in the land of Judah. I mean, what more absurd, what greater absurd can you find than that the greatest gay, gay parade the greatest, the most glorious gay parade is held in the capital of the state of Israel. In the capital of the state of Israel, led by their mayor. So anyway, the other word, in other words, here in this last verse that we read in this chapter, they just get circumcised physically, but not really in their heart. So they're going to be punished with everyone else who is not circumcised. <laughs> 